So understanding the energy exchange at the snow surface is so important because so much happens right here. You've got all the atmospheric conditions going on and, and can set up some really big changes here. And it's hard because the one thing we can see is the sunshine, we can feel the air temperature, but there's so much more going on. And if you can learn to understand these processes, it'll unlock a whole new world where you see things happening that you never saw before, or even things that you have been seeing, you start to understand the patterns, why there's dry snow there and wet snow there, why there's a crust there, why there's surface hoar there, but not there. And that comes from understanding this exchange of energy happening right at the snow surface. In this three-part video, Mark Staples and I are going to look at the processes that transfer heat energy to and from the snow surface. In part two, we will briefly describe how the energy exchange forms key persistent weak layers and their role in slab avalanche formation. In this first part, we'll briefly describe the ways in which heat can be transferred to and from the snow surface, and then we'll focus on the radiation exchange. It helps to understand the three primary modes of heat transfer or energy exchange going on out here. One is radiation, which includes solar radiation that we're all familiar with. It also includes long wave radiation, which is the exchange of heat uh, between any two objects. Uh, with the snow, it's often a net loss to a clear sky, but a cloudy skies can actually end up um, adding a net gain of heat to the snow. It can also be an exchange of energy or heat between rocks and trees or any other objects looking at the snow. The second one is convection, and that has to do with a moving fluid, like generally wind, but it can also include rain or snow that can add heat to the snowpack. And then finally, the other is conduction, and that's the transfer of heat by two things that are touching each other. So my hand is touching the snow, heat is being transferred from my hand into the snow, my hand is losing heat, getting cold. Conduction is really the primary form of heat transfer through the snow through all those, that lattice of ice bonds. There can be a little uh, heat transfer through the vapor diffusion. Um, we generally lump that into a thermal, an effective thermal conductivity that just accounts for all the heat transfer through conduction and those other means down through the snow. So that's the primary way heat moves through here. But as you know, in snow caves and igloos, snow is a really good insulator. So it doesn't transfer heat very well through conduction, and that's really important to remember. Let's look at a stove element to see the difference between short and long wave radiation. At the medium setting, even after a couple of minutes, there is no visible light, no short wave radiation coming from the element. There is only long wave radiation. Surfaces like snow, walls, clothing, and skin emit only long wave radiation. After I turn the element to high and wait a few minutes, it turns red because some of the emitted radiation is shortwave. Surfaces like the sun that are red hot or hotter emit shortwave radiation. Once you learn it and understand it, you can imagine the radiation exchange between the sky and terrain features. You'll learn to understand how the energy exchange processes under clear skies and under cloudy skies. This understanding allows one to make a good hypothesis of what is happening in the upper snowpack before entering the snow slope or before selecting a site for targeted snowpack observations. A heat transfer can either change the temperature or the phase of a material like snow. A heat transfer that changes the temperature of a substance like water, snow, or ice, but not its phase, is called a sensible heat transfer. It is called sensible since we can feel it. So if the wind is warmer than the snow, it will warm the snow surface, which is a sensible heat transfer. A latent heat transfer changes the phase or state of a substance, for example, ice melting or water freezing, without temperature change. In this clip, rain is melting the snow surface. The temperature of the wet snow is zero degrees Celsius, and it does not change during that latent heat transfer. So let's look at a graph with the temperature on the vertical axis and the internal heat energy on the horizontal axis. When a piece of ice is warmed from minus 20 degrees Celsius to zero, it takes this much heat. 
It's sensible heat. We can feel it, and there's no phase change like melting. If we continue to add heat to the ice at zero degrees, it melts. That's a latent heat transfer. It takes this much heat. The latent heat transfer is about eight times more than the heat required to warm the same piece of ice from minus 20 degrees to zero degrees. The relatively large latent heat of melting is why rain can have such a strong effect on the upper snowpack. When liquid water is warmed, that's another sensible heat transfer. It extends off the graph. There's more to the graph for vaporizing water, but this is the most important part of the graph for this video. Now let's do a shallow dive into the radiation exchange at the snow surface, starting with shortwave radiation. Most of the radiation from the sun that penetrates the atmosphere is shortwave radiation, much of which we can see with our eyes. On days when there are no clouds, much of the direct shortwave radiation reaches the Earth's surface and casts distinct shadows. When shortwave radiation reaches the snow surface, most of it reflects off the snow surface. This is why you can get a sunburn on the underside of your chin while moving over the snow. This percentage of shortwave radiation that is reflected is known as the albedo. The albedo varies with the size of the snow grains, moisture, and particles on the snow surface, but it's typically around 90%. Fresh dry snow can reflect around 95%, which is why on sunny days with fresh dry snow, you may find yourself squinting, even while wearing sunglasses. Some shortwave radiation from the sun reflects off clouds. The shortwave radiation that passes through the clouds is diffuse. Either there are no shadows, or the shadows are indistinct. Again, about 90% of the downward shortwave radiation is reflected, but compared to under a clear sky, there is less of it to be reflected. More on that in a bit. As an example of albedo, the solar panels with no snow were receiving an average of 48 watts, whereas the snow panels with a few centimeters of snow were receiving an average of 4 watts. Most of the 91% reduction in solar radiation was due to shortwave radiation reflecting off the snow surface. Since about 90% of shortwave radiation reflects off the snow surface, that means about 10% is absorbed by and warms the upper snowpack. As a ballpark number, only about 10% of the absorbed shortwave radiation penetrates deeper than 10 centimeters, which is about 1% of the shortwave radiation that reaches the snow surface. So, if you cut the roof of your snow cave too thin during the day, you will notice more light, most of which is shortwave radiation, getting through the thin areas of the snow cave roof. The shortwave radiation that is absorbed warms the upper snowpack rapidly. Ed LaChapelle has emphasized that rapid warming can lead to avalanches. Let's look at how shortwave radiation varies between day and night. Shortwave radiation from the sky peaks midday and is negligible at night. Also, less shortwave radiation, sometimes only about a third, reaches the snow surface when the sky is overcast compared to when the sky is clear. Of course, the cloud cover often changes during the day. Let's look at how the shortwave radiation reaching a north-facing slope can change when the sky changes from clear to broken. So we've had some bright sunshine and direct solar radiation and it was bouncing off of these north facing slopes but now with these clouds moving in the clouds scatter the sunlight and we get diffuse solar radiation so now those rays of sunshine come down they hit the clouds and they bounce in all directions and so now we're getting more solar input actually into these north facing slopes because the sunshine comes down hits the clouds and then a part of it will then bounce down right into the snow Okay, now let's consider long-wave radiation. Any surface that does not glow emits long-wave radiation, which we can't see with our eyes. On cloudy days, the upward long-wave radiation from the snow surface reaches the water droplets in the clouds and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Some of this upward long-wave radiation is absorbed and re-emitted as long-wave radiation in all directions, which contributes to the greenhouse effect. On cloudy days, the upward long-wave radiation is often slightly greater than the downward long-wave radiation from cloud base, so the snow surface is losing radiant heat. In other words, the combined or net long-wave radiation is negative. In this infrared image, the warm colors of the trees shows that the trees are emitting long-wave radiation. Also, there is long-wave radiation from the darker blue of the snow surface. Snow is a very efficient emitter of long-wave radiation. 
its long wave emissivity is almost the maximum value of one, which is for an ideal black body radiator. This is why the snow surface cools rapidly to a clear sky. Even when the sky is clear, some of the upward long wave radiation is absorbed and re emitted by the greenhouse gases, as well as by the limited water droplets in the atmosphere. When the sky is clear, the downward long wave radiation is much less than the upward radiation, and the net exchange of long wave radiation is upward. The snow surface tends to be substantially cooler than the air at night. In trying to understand this exchange of long wave radiation, it's helpful to think about what the terrain or the snow is seeing. So in this case, this snow right here by me is looking up at this tree and exchanging long wave radiation, specifically receiving long wave radiation and heat from this tree. Compare that with just behind me, that snow by the snowmobile has a clear view of the skies. And as long as the skies are clear, that snow can be much colder because it's emitting long wave radiation and losing heat to the clear skies. Now let's look at the temperature profile in the upper snowpack. In this example, the sky was mostly clear. The temperature profile is influenced by short and long wave radiation exchange at the snow surface, as well as, as Mark mentioned, the slow conduction of heat within the snowpack. The snow surface temperature warms during the day and cools at night. This causes the temperature profile in the upper 20 to 30 centimeters of the snowpack to swing, which is sometimes known as the swan's neck. Here's an example in which the snow surface is cooler than the air under a sky with broken clouds. So we do see a big difference between air temperature and snow temperature. The primary reason is that snow loses a ton of heat to clear skies. Today, we have a mix of clouds and clear sky. So what we're seeing is an air temperature of about minus four degrees Celsius. And then right here, where I've been measuring the snow surface, minus 10. So we have a six degree difference in temperature between the air and the snow. That's because the snow is losing some heat to the patches of clear sky but the broken clouds are keeping um, doing that long wave radiation exchange and keeping it from cooling off too much. Let's see how Mark's measurement compares with an independent study. This graph shows the difference between snow surface temperature and air temperature for various levels of cloud cover. In Mark's example, for a broken sky, the snow surface was six degrees cooler than the air, which is consistent with these measurements. When the sky was overcast, the snow surface averaged about two degrees cooler than the air, showing the net long wave radiation was typically upwards. Under clear sky, the snow surface was often about 10 degrees cooler than the air, showing the strong effect of outgoing radiation to a clear sky. With few or scattered clouds, the temperature difference generally fell between the values for clear sky and for broken sky. However, the surface temperatures for this graph were measured in the shade where shortwave radiation from the sun is reduced. Let's look at two examples in which the snow surface is in the sun. On this January day, the air temperature was below freezing. However, on this sunny slope, we skinned up through a few centimeters of moist, sticky snow. So this is an example when the absorbed shortwave radiation exceeded net longwave radiation and started to melt the snow surface. The sky remained clear during the following night and the snow surface froze into a crust. Yeah, you know what that did to the skiing. When there are thin clouds, as in this photo, the snow surface can be warmer than the air temperature on sunny slopes and on gentle terrain. Sometimes the snow surface can melt. So this is another example when absorbed shortwave radiation can exceed net longwave radiation. So summarizing the strong processes, when the sky is mostly clear, radiation often dominates the energy exchange at the snow surface. This morning photo shows frost that formed overnight on a car window due to strong long wave cooling to a clear sky. In the morning, when the incoming shortwave radiation from the sun hit the mirror, it warmed and melted the frost. In part three of this video series, we'll get to rain and wind, which sometimes strongly contribute to the energy exchange at the snow surface. But next, in part two, we'll explain how the radiation exchange at the snow surface contributes to the formation of persistent weak layers.